Wasn't that awesome? Not really? <laughs> I mean, just totally out of the blue. It was nice. I got to write a couple new songs. That was kind of fun. I have a song relevant to the thing that I'll play later uh, in the uh, lecture today that I, maybe at least some of you will relate to. Um, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, I had gotten a little bit ahead on the lecture last time, so now I'm a little bit behind, but at least I'm not a lot behind, which is, uh, which is good. Um, I'm going to go through and talk uh, more about um, nucleotide uh, metabolism today. And as I mentioned uh, last time we met, this is the last of the uh, me metabolism that we'll be talking about. So um, don't shed any tears. Uh, last time when I finished, I had gotten uh, through the process. And I noted that you know, there were a lot of intermediates and a lot of structures. And um, you're not going to be responsible for naming and drawing those structures. There are some of the highlights. And wherever I've talked about specific ones in uh, the lecture, you are responsible for those. Okay, so make sure that if I've talked about them, that you go and, and look at them. Okay, um, one of those structures, not structures, but one of those intermediates um, is on the screen. It's labeled as uridylate, which I don't like the name. UMP is much more um, uh, informative, I think. Uridine monophosphate. Um, there's the uracil base, there's the ribose sugar, and there's the phosphate. This is the first nucleotide that appears in the synthetic pathway that is something that ends up ultimately in RNA and DNA. Okay? Um, this guy here is a, um, a precursor, as we will see, of uh, one of the deoxyribonucleotides as well. And we'll see that their metabolism is considerably different from that of the ribonucleotides. And they, they get made in an interesting way. They're made from the ribonucleotides. And uh, uh, thymidine, in particular, is interesting because it's made from this UMP that you see here. The um, UMP, uh, as I noted, and I don't have a figure to show you this, but the UMP, um, in order to be used to make RNA and DNA, is that noisy? It sounds noisy to me, so maybe we should close this. UMP, um, as I noted, in order to be made into RNA, uh, has to be made into the triphosphate first. So to make it into the triphosphate, that requires putting two more phosphates on. And there are two sets of enzymes involved in doing this. Okay? So the first set of enzymes is, or the first enzyme in this case, is one of a class of enzymes that we call nucleoside monophosphate kinases. Now, as we've seen before with the other enzymes we've talked about in the citric acid cycle and glycolysis and so forth, the name tells us what it does. A nucleoside is, of course, uh, uh, something that's the, the uh, nucleotide without the sugar. A nucleoside monophosphate refers to the nucleotide. So we're talking about UMP, nucleoside monophosphate kinase. And a kinase puts a phosphate onto something that's a nucleoside monophosphate. So it's going to convert something that's a monophosphate into something that's a diphosphate. Okay? Each monophosphate nucleotide has a corresponding nucleoside monophosphate kinase. Now, that's a mouthful of a name. What do you say we call it UMP kinase? Now, UMP kinase makes some sense, right? UMP kinase means it puts a phosphate onto UMP and it makes UDP. There's a corresponding CMP kinase, a corresponding uh, GMP kinase, and a corresponding AMP kinase. Okay? Each one of those working on a specific monophosphate to convert it into a diphosphate. And the naming, if we use that naming, and yes, we will use that naming that I just gave you, if we use that naming, it's very simple to keep track of them. So there's a specific one for each one of those. We talked about nucleoside monophosphate kinases when we talked about enzyme mechanisms briefly. Okay? I'll let you go back and look at that if you want, but you don't need to know that. But we have briefly talked about them before. Notice that what they do. They take the energy from ATP 
to put the phosphate onto the monophosphate, and you end up with, in this case, UDP plus ADP. That makes sense? Now, this reaction can actually run backwards. So let's say the cell were to need some ATP. It could take two diphosphates, run it backwards, make a monophosphate, and make ATP. Okay? Now I show you that this particular one doesn't go backwards very much because there's not usually an awful lot of UDP sitting around freely in the cell. But when we talk about ADP, the cell sometimes has a lot of ADP sitting around in the cell. So if we were to have an AMP kinase, okay, if we had AMP kinase and we had ADP here instead of UDP, what it means is we could take two ADPs and make an ATP and an AMP. All right. Now you guys haven't thought about this before, but I told you before that AMP was an indication of low energy, right? All right. Now you know how it gets made. And now you know why it's an indication of low energy, because it's going to be made when cells need ATP and they have a lot of ADP. So AMP kinase turns out to be an important backup energy source for cells, because they can make one ATP from every two ADPs that they have. That makes sense? Clear as mud? OK. Well, moving forward from there, we've got a diphosphate. In this case, we've got UDP. We might have ADP. We might have CDP. We might have GDP. All right? Things at this point get simpler, not more complicated. Because the enzyme that converts diphosphates to triphosphates works on all of the diphosphates, one enzyme. This enzyme is known as NDPK. NDPK stands for nucleoside diphosphokinase. All right? You'll know it as NDPK. But notice it says diphosphate here. A lot of uh, nomenclature is diphospho as well. So diphosphate kinase, diphosphokinase, same thing. All right. Now, this enzyme will work on, you notice it says X. So X can be any diphosphate, and T can be any triphosphate. OK? Any diphosphate, any triphosphate. Yes? Oh, you're right, there is. That should be YDP. That is a, that is a typo. Thanks for noticing. didn't notice that. This right here should be YDP. Right. Now, what this means is that I can readily interconvert any of the diphosphates and triphosphates. If I have too much of one diphosphate and not enough of a triphosphate, I can use, I can swap. Okay, so I can swap things back and forth. This allows, it's one of the ways cells have of balancing the relative amounts of triphosphates that they have. Okay? Well, now I've gotten things up to the triphosphate level. Now, we've talked about you, not you, but uridine uh, nucleotides. It's all about me, right? It's all about you, it's all about me, all right? We've talked about uridine nucleotides. We haven't talked about thymidine, which will happen when we talk about deoxyribonucleotides. And we haven't talked about cytidine nucleotides, all right? Well, it turns out cytidine nucleotides are made from UTP. So we go to UMP as we've already seen, UMP gets converted to UDP, and then UDP gets converted to UTP, and then CTP gets made from UTP. That reaction is shown right here. All right? Here's UTP. Here is a deamination. Okay? Um, I'm sorry, an amination. It's, it's an amination going this direction. It's a deamination going backwards. All right? So if we go from UTP to CTP, we have to replace the oxygen with a nitrogen, making an amine, and that gives us CTP. So now we've got ribonucleotides necessary to make the pyrimidines in RNA. 
CTP, and UTP. Okay? For all purposes now, we have completed the synthesis of ribopyrimidines, UTP and CTP. Now notice what happened in making those ribopyrimidines. We started, we made the ring first, and then we attached the ribose afterwards. Okay? Or uh, sort of in the middle, I shouldn't say that. We sort of in the middle, we attached the ribose. All right? But we didn't start with ribose and build on that ribose. Purines, we will see, start with the ribose and build on that. Okay? That's a difference between purines and pyrimidines. Now, before I finish with pyrimidines, I want to go back and remind you of the regulation of these. I sort of skimmed over that before because we have talked about it, but I want to make sure I hammer a point home with you. Okay? Let's go back and think about the regulatory enzyme ATCase. Okay? ATCase. ATCase is coming up. Uh, where did I put it? That's not it. Okay, here's um, ATCase in action. We're taking aspartate, we're taking carbamyl phosphate. This is the reaction that's catalyzed by ATCase. You remember, I hope, when I talked about ATCase um, uh, last term, that I talked about ATCase being a regulatory enzyme, and I said it was the most important regulatory enzyme in pyrimidine biosynthesis. It was activated by ATP, and it was inhibited by feedback inhibition by CTP. So now you've seen the endpoint of the pathway, which is CTP. CTP can feedback and inhibit this enzyme. And when it inhibits this enzyme, it stops the cell from making too many pyrimidines. The fact that ATP activates the enzyme indicates that the cell, that this enzyme is important in balancing purines versus pyrimidines. If we have lots of ATP, it's going to be more likely that the ATP will bind to the enzyme and cause it to start making pyrimidines. If we have lots of, of CTP, it's more likely that CTP is going to bind to the enzyme and cause the cell to turn off the synthesis of pyrimidines. So this is the primary enzyme that helps to balance purines versus pyrimidines. Okay? Now we're going to see, when we talk about purines, that there's other things that are involved in uh, regulating the relative amounts of purines. But this one regulates purine versus pyrimidine. Am I clear on that? Okay. So that's the, the de novo synthesis of pyrimidines. All right. We turn our attention now to talk about purine biosynthesis. And purine biosynthesis starts in a very different kind of a way. Again, we're going to start with de novo synthesis, meaning starting from scratch and synthesizing these purines anew. If we look at the purine ring, okay, the general structure of a purine ring, or rings, what we see is the source of all of the different atoms that appear in the ring. Okay? Again, I want to emphasize that what we see are things coming from very simple compounds, for the most part. All right? Carbon dioxide is the source of that carbon. Glycine is the source of the core of the molecule. This is a methyl donor that we'll talk about later that makes that carbon and also donates for this carbon. They're slightly, uh, actually these two are the same, but there are other ones that are involved in other purines. There's glutamine donating the nitrogen. There's glutamine donating this nitrogen. And there's aspartic acid donating this nitrogen. Simple things to make the purine rings. The ribose, of course, is abundant in cells, and it comes as PRPP. We saw that in the synthesis of pyrimidines, and it's actually a starting point for the synthesis of purines. So we start with PRPP as a way of making uh, the purines. So let's go through that process. All right. Here is a... Uh, 
phosphoribosyl amine, okay? Phosphoribosyl amine. There's actually a step that's prior to this that's not shown on here, and that step prior to this that's shown, not shown is PRPP going to this compound right here. It's unfortunate it's not shown here because that enzyme that makes this compound right here, the phosphoribosylamine, the enzyme that makes this compound from PRPP is the most important regulatory enzyme for purine synthesis. Now, it's an interesting enzyme. I'm going to give you the name. It's got a mouthful of a name. It's called PRPP amidotransferase. PRPP amidotransferase. That's an amido, A-M-I-D-O. This enzyme is very interesting. It's very interesting. I'm going to talk about it uh, later when we get to um, how cells decide how much GTP and how much ATP to make. But it's got a very interesting regulatory system to balance how much ATP and how much GTP to make. Okay? So I'm going to save that for later. But I want you to remember that enzyme that's involved in making this compound, PRPP amido transferase. Okay. Well, let's um, look at this. Uh, again, there's a lot of intermediates. There's a lot of structures. We're not going to go through and memorize these names. We're not going to memorize these structures. But I do think you should know that the synthesis of purines is starting with a, with a PRPP, that is starting with a ribose ring. Okay? We see that on this ribose ring, and remember here's ribose in every case attached we see that the ribose ring starts out with just an amine, and then we start seeing parts of the structure growing, 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 growing. Finally, we end up with something that starts to look like a purine nucleotide. Okay? So this is being built onto the PRPP, built onto the ribose ring. Now, um, there are, as you can look at this carefully, you'll see several interesting things. One is that there's involvement of this thing called a carbon, a single carbon donor. And that single carbon donor is known as a folate. Okay? Folate is a vitamin. It's necessary for you to have it in your diet. Shortage of folate in pregnant mothers leads to neural tube defects. And it's one of the reasons that in recent years, folate has now been added to a variety of foods as a supplement, like bread, so that pregnant mothers have sufficient folates in their diet. We didn't know that um, uh, a few years ago. We now know that, and folates are very important for uh, a maturing fetus. The THF is tetrahydrofolate. And we'll see that folates are very important in the synthesis of nucleotides, because Nucleotide synthesis requires, in several places, the addition of a single carbon. The addition of a single carbon. Okay. Folate metabolism is very interesting. It's used for a variety of things, and I'll say more about that later. So we see a single carbon coming in here. There's the blue carbon. We can see the blue carbon going in. Okay. We also see energy. Look at the energy, ATP. Here's ATP. Here's ATP. Okay. Building and making things takes energy. Making nucleotides is energetically uh, uh, costly. Okay. Well, ATP itself is a nucleotide. Where did the ATP come from? Right? Well, the important thing to remember is cells never start empty. They always start with part of what was in the previous cell. That includes some ATP, includes proteins and enzymes as well, because if it didn't have those, it wouldn't go anywhere. Right? So ATP is used to make more ATP. ATP is used to make other nucleotides. We know that, that ATP energy is necessary in order for us to move forward. Finally, we get down here and we see a couple of other things. Notice, here's fumarate. Fumarate coming from the citric acid cycle. We talked about how the citric acid cycle was what we called anaplerotic, meaning to fill up. And I told you that things could be broken down to intermediates in the citric acid cycle and then energy derived. I also said that some of the things could be taken 
from the citric acid cycle and used to make other compounds. Here is fumarate involved in the synthesis of nucleotides. What happens if the cell is low in energy, guys? What happens if there's very little fumarate? It means nucleotide biosynthesis is not going to occur. And this makes very logical sense. If the cell is low in energy, is it going to be dividing? No. If it's not dividing, is it going to have as much need for nucleotides? No. Very interesting regulation. Yes? Fumarate is produced. You're, you're, right. you're actually right there. That is a byproduct. Uh, but it is, uh, yeah, I've said this backwards. It, it, it's, it's not making fumarate. It's actually uh, producing fumarate. Uh, but there is a, where do I have it? Um, aspartic acid. It goes in as aspartic acid and comes out as fumarate. So you're right. I've, I've said that backwards. All right. Again, but it's the same principle. Aspartic acid is an, a, an amino acid necessary for cells to make enzymes, to divide, et cetera, et cetera. This is giving feedback to the citric acid cycle about energy and needs for energy. Yes, I said that. All right, now, um, the product of all this is a compound called inosinate, which you're much more likely to call IMP. IMP is the first purine nucleotide. Now, you've never heard of I being in, talking about you, now I'm talking about I, all right? Never heard about I appearing in RNA and DNA, but it turns out, in fact, that I does appear in some transfer RNAs. We'll talk about that later. Okay? So inosine appears in some transfer RNAs, and um, its significance we'll talk about later. Okay? For our purposes, IMP is a very important compound because it's a branch on the synthesis to making GMP and AMP. And this is what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. It's a branch on the way to making GMP and AMP. Okay? Here's what that looks like. Here is IMP on the left. IMP can go up the top path and produce AMP. IMP can go down the bottom path and make GMP. Okay? Now, if it goes on the top path to make AMP, look what happens. All right? There is GTP, there's aspartic acid coming in again. Here is fumarate coming out again. Okay? And what we see is that energy for making AMP is coming from GTP. If we look at the pathway down the bottom, we see that energy for making GMP comes from ATP. Talk about balance. A lot of ATP and little GMP is going to favor the synthesis of GMP. A lot of GTP and little AMP is going to favor the synthesis of AMP. It turns out that these enzymes, which we don't, I don't, I'm not going to give you names here, but these enzymes right here, this enzyme, for the top one, and this enzyme for the bottom one, are each inhibited by the respective end product. AMP inhibits this enzyme. GMP inhibits this enzyme going down the bottom. Cells have to balance how much of the nucleotides they have. GMP turns off its own synthesis at this point and it makes the pathway go to the top to AMP. AMP turns off its own synthesis and forces the path to go to the bottom to make GMP. This balance here allows cells to balance how much AMP and how much GMP they have. Yes? Oh, I thought you had a question. You're scratching your head. <laughs> I saw a hand start to go. Yes, question up there. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. So AMP affects the synthesis of GMP, and GMP affects the synthesis of AMP. That is, high levels of GTP 
give rise to AMP. High levels of ATP give rise to synthesis of GMP. OK? So there's balance. So with this, we're balancing the relative amounts of AMP versus GMP. OK? That's pretty cool. Now, let's go back to PRPP amidotransferase. PRPP amidotransferase. OK? PRPP amidotransferase was that very first enzyme that was regulated in the pathway. The very first enzyme that we had in the pathway. Let's see, do I have? Uh, I don't have that. OK, so the very first enzyme of the pathway was shown up here. Okay. We get down here to the ino inosinate, we've got a branch point. The very first enzyme in the pathway was PRPP amidotransferase. I said, it was a very important regulatory enzyme, and you're saying, but these other enzymes you talked about are also important. Well, it turns out this first one is interesting. Right? The first enzyme was PRPP, amidotransfer PRPP amidotransferase. It's inhibited by both AMP and GMP, both. If I have one, but not the other, it's only partly inhibited. It takes both to completely inhibit the enzyme. Now, why is that important? That's important because imagine that I'm a cell and I've got a lot of adenosine nucleotides, but very little guanosine nucleotides. If I, complete, if I had only AMP shut off this enzyme, then what would happen? I wouldn't be able to make any GMP. But AMP binds this enzyme and turns the enzyme down, but it doesn't turn it off. It allows a little bit of synthesis to continue, and by allowing a little bit of synthesis to continue, a little bit of IMP gets made. And that little bit of IMP can in turn be used to make IMP, if I have plenty of AMP, it's going to go down here and make this. So I turn the enzyme down, but I don't turn it off, and I allow the synthesis of GMP, because when it gets to here, a lot of AMP is going to turn off this top pathway and activate the bottom pathway. Similarly, if I have lots of GMP, the same thing happens. PRPP amidotransferase is turned down. A small amount of IMP is made. But GMP will inhibit its own synthesis, so that'll be used to make AMP. Very cool, very clever scheme. Cells are balancing AMP versus GMP. Very, very cool. Yes? So the question is, is feedback inhibition by itself not en enough to balance those two? I hope what I've told you answers that question. Okay? That is, that if I were to completely shut it off, then I wouldn't be able to balance it, right? So the answer is that feedback inhibition would really leave me hanging. I wouldn't have enough to make the other one, right? Pretty cool balance. Why do you need to slow it down? Okay. Why do I why do I have a speed limit in going on the way to Fred Meyer? I don't want to overshoot something. So that slowing it down is important for that purpose, right? Same reason. Yes? There's two phosphates needed for AMP. AMP has to go to ADP, goes to ATP. GMP goes to GDP, goes to GTP. Right? Am I not understanding? Question here, Omar. Is it more energetically costly to make GMP? Well. Here's an ATP, here's a GTP. So the answer is basically not from a, a triphosphate perspective, but it is um, actually producing energy here. It's not producing energy up here. So it's more, per, it's more energy costly to go the top pathway than it is to go the bottom pathway. Right. So this is affecting the energy it takes to do that. That's correct. I'm sorry? Oh, here. Oh, I see. You're asking because it's AMP here. Yes, but notice we're making an NADH here that can be used to make additional triphosphate. I, I'm sorry. I didn't understand your question initially. Yes? Uh, 
Oh boy, here's a good question. So if you start producing a lot of this here, is that going to turn off its own synthesis over here? It sure could if you had plenty of it. You bet. You bet. Very good questions. OK. OK, so cool stuff. Now, so we've balanced now purines versus pyrimidines. We've balanced within the purines. One thing I haven't told you is how do we balance within the pyrimidines? And it turns out there's a way to do that as well. It's not quite as slick and elegant as it is for the purines. Okay. First of all, we have a decision. Do we make purines or do we not make, uh, I'm asking, do we make pyrimidines or do we not make pyrimidines? All right. That decision is made by ATCAs, right? If we have more purines, we're going to make pyrimidines. If we have more pyrimidines, we're not going to make pyrimidines, right? Everybody with me? Within the pyrimidine pathway, there's one thing I didn't show you or tell you, and that's this enzyme right here, the one that converts UTP to CTP. This enzyme is called CTP synthase, very simple name. It's the last regulated enzyme in pyrimidine biosynthesis. The last regulated enzyme in pyrimidine biosynthesis. It's inhibited by CTP. We've got two things that inhibit CTP. ATC, that's inhibited by CTP. CTP inhibits ATCAs, CTP inhibits this guy right here. Now, when you say, well, if that inhibits this right here, if I've already inhibited the synthesis of ATCAs, how does this provide balance? It provides balance because if I have too much of this guy, what's going to happen? Reverse reaction to make UTP. This enzyme is balancing automatically UTP versus CTP. Yes? This enzyme is called CTP synthase, S-Y-N-T-H-A-S-E. All right, so reiterating, we've balanced purines versus pyrimidines with ATCAs. We've balanced purine, that is AMP versus GMP with PRPP and mitotransferase. We've balanced UTP versus CTP with CTP synthase. And we're going to see similar things, interesting things, that are going to happen when we start talking about deoxyribonucleotides because they're regulated even more interestingly than these guys. I told you that nucleotide biosynthesis was the most important regulation that the cell has enzymatically for metabolic pathways. Okay, questions before I move to deoxyribonucleotides? Sure. Uh, go back through the slide before this. You're talking about this enzyme, uh, this pathway, right? Uh, oh, oh, AMP. Okay. This this one up here. Yeah. This one. So if you have too much GMP, and you still are producing from the PRPP mitotransferase purines, then it's going to favor this one up here. That's correct. But then the reaction is also still making AMP, right? This reaction is making AMP. That's correct. Right. So your question is, will this affect the synthesis up here? Yeah. Yeah, that's what was asked here earlier. And I said, yes, it will. OK? But remember that we only have a fixed amount of ATP AMP. So this isn't going to provide a giant amount new of AMP. Because once this gets produced, it's going to go back in, make ATP again. right? So the relative amounts of the AMPs aren't going to change drastically as a result of this. Yeah. OK. Other questions? Let's talk about deoxyribonucleotides. We're almost there. OK, you're going to see that there's some complicated things, but there's actually some fairly simple things here. Here's the simplification. How do we make ribonucleotides? Well, three of them we make very, very simply. Okay? Three of them come from okay, 
directly from ADP, GDP, and CDP. In fact, all four of them produce an intermediate that has a D in front of it, meaning it's deoxy. This enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase, which is what catalyzes these reactions, the same enzyme works on all of the ribonucleoside diphosphates. Ribonucleotide reductase, which you can call RNR if you wish, converts all of the ribonucleoside diphosphates into deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates. All right? Now, what that means, you memorize one more enzyme name. Once I've made DADP, I can convert it to DATP using NDPK. So NDPK works on all of the diphosphates, including the deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates. One enzyme to go from here to here, one enzyme to go from here to here. This is NDPK. This is NDPK. This is NDPK. And this is not NDPK. Okay? It turns out it is. Well, actually, there, there's a couple other steps we have to consider. Okay? But NDPK converts all the deoxys to triphosphates. And it also converts DUTP, but it doesn't get directly to TTP. We've got to go through a couple of other steps. Let's look at how we get from DUDP to DUTP. Or, I'm sorry, to TTP, not to DUTP. By the way, uh, it's confusing because, I'm oh, sorry. Most books like this book don't put a D in front of the TTP. And they don't because they say, well, when it's thymidine, it's already a deoxy. All right? I think that it's appropriate to put a D in front of it. Okay? You don't have to if you don't want to. But when I use this nomenclature, I will always put a D in front of the thymine nucleotide just to be consistent with all the other deoxyribonucleotides. Does that make sense? Okay. So if that's confusing you, just put a D in front of it, and it'll make more sense to you. Okay. Now, we need to understand how we get from DUDP to DTTP. There's a couple of steps that's involved in that process. So I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to talk about how RNR is regulated. Okay? How RNR is regulated. Thymidine synthesis looks pretty hairy, but it's not. All right? I'm going to tell you in words how it goes, and then we're going to look at all this crap that's going on up here. All right? In words, how does it go? All right? We start with DUD, I'm sorry, we start with UDP which goes to DUDP. That's ribonucleotide reductase. DUDP gets converted into DUTP. What's the enzyme that does that? NDPK. So just like the other nucleotides, we've gone to a triphosphate, but you say, we don't need DUTP, right? Because we don't put U's into DNA. And it turns out that if we let too much DUTP accumulated, that's exactly what cells will do. They'll start putting U's into DNA. That's not good. You don't want U's in your DNA. All right? So cells aren't stupid. Well, they are kind of stupid because they first make the DUTP, right? And then they destroy it. They have an enzyme called DUTPase converts DUTP to DUMP, dump. Going from DUTP to DUMP. Now I'll step you through this after I've taken you through the whole process. That's the dump that you see right here on the screen. All right? Yes? The enzyme that takes the uh, DUTP to DUMP, that enzyme is called uh, is called uh, DUTPase, DUTPase, converting the triphosphate to the monophosphate. The reason that's done is to keep that U from getting incorporated into DNA, because DNA polymerase will look at DUTP and say, oh, look, this is a T, and it's not, because it looks like a T. All right? 
DUMP is then converted, so here's D, DUMP, is converted into DTMP. DTMP is this guy right here with a D in front of it. DUMP is converted to DTMP by an enzyme called thymidylate synthase. And there's a lot of names and a lot of structures here. Thymidylate synthase. What's all this other stuff on here? All right. What's all this other stuff on here? If we look at the difference between DUMP and DTMP, we see that the difference is this carbon right here. All right? This is a terrible figure, by the way. All right? This is the thing we're interested in here in black. This thing shouldn't even be up here. But it's showing us this guy right here is coming from the folate. The folate is donating that carbon and putting that methyl group on there. And that methyl is what makes it a DTMP. Can you call that enzyme TMP synthase? Um, actually, I think you should call it thymidylate synthase, since that's the way it's more commonly known. Thymidylate synthase, yeah. Sorry. All right. Now, I'm going to review what we've, just, what we've just done. All right? We started with UDP. We converted UDP to DUDP by what enzyme? RNR. We converted DUDP to DUTP by? NDPK, we converted DUTP to DUMP by UMP, I'm sorry, DUTPase. We converted DUMP to DTMP by thymidylate synthase. Once we've got the monophosphate, we're going to have a DTMP monokinase, which is going to give us DTDP. And what's going to make the triphosphate? NDPK again. We finally have DTTP. Now, that's a convoluted pathway. That's a very convoluted pathway. Yes? Why don't we see what? Why don't you see DTMP that's not deoxy? It turns out you actually do see it in some cases. Our transfer RNAs turn out to be very unusual RNAs. And you actually, in some cases, in transfer RNAs, see what are called ribothymidine. They're not made by this, but they're made by a different mechanism. And you actually do see it in transfer RNA. Now you're sitting here thinking, well, why does a cell go to the trouble of doing this? Why should it put T into DNA? Why doesn't it just use U? Why doesn't it just put U in DNA? Anybody want to conjecture a guess on that one? You probably don't know the answer to that one. Yeah? It can be converted to cytosine, but that's not a common thing that's going to happen to you. It turns out that U can form stable base pairs with G. Now, what you wanted to pair with is A. If you have U's in your DNA, you're going to favor, more than you would otherwise, G's where there should be A's. Okay? When you have T's there, they won't pair with G normally. You will. Okay? So that is one of the primary reasons why we have T in DNA and not U. And that's why the cell doesn't want to have U in DNA. Everybody with me? So that His question is, that doesn't matter in RNA. Well, it turns out it does matter in RNA, because when we go to make RNA, we can make a mistake more commonly than we make in making DNA. Shh. The main reason that's not important is RNAs don't stay around forever. If you make a mistake making an RNA, it eventually gets broken down and doesn't hang around. But in the genome, you want that to hang around. Make sense? Yeah. Does what now? Could have put a base pair in that shouldn't be in there anyway. That's what I said was the problem. I'm not sure I understand your question. Okay. So, 
Can it be repaired? Well, when we, I'm going to say that there's actually a good question about the repair. So when we go talking about repair, we're going to see that you makes it into DNA sometimes. And cells have ways of fixing that. When they, have, when they sense that there's a you in the DNA, they've got a repair system that yanks it out. So you does make it into DNA at a low frequency. That you can happen either by misincorporation or by chemical change. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the, the synthesis of DNA later. Okay, good questions, very good questions. Okay, that's a lot of material today. It's a lot of stuff. Um, let me see, hold on. I want, all right, I know, I know what I'm going to do to finish. Okay, so I'm going to finish planting an idea in your head, and then I'm going to reinforce it next time. Okay? So I'm going to repeat what I'm going to tell you here next time. And that is the regulation of ribonucleotide reductase. All right? The regulation of ribonucleotide reductase. Okay? Here is that enzyme, RNR. RNR converts the diphosphates to triphosphates, and it's the one that's primarily responsible for balancing how much of any given deoxyribonucleotide that you have. Okay? It uses something called a tyrosine radical in order to pull the oxygen off of position two in the ribose. Remember? To go from ribose to deoxyribose, the difference is the oxygen on position number two. This enzyme is going to yank that oxygen off. It does so by use of an interesting tyrosine radical that is found in the small subunits of the enzyme. This is communicated to the large subunits, which catalyze the reaction. Okay? Now, I said I was going to talk about the regulation of that, all right? I want to do that very briefly. That's not what I want there. What I want is, that's actually the reaction process. We're not going to go through that, okay? And, oh, where's it at? Where's it at? You want to memorize all that? Nah. Uh, I don't see my thing. Will we have time for a song? <laughs> I'm guessing the, the natives are restless. <laughs> Why don't I look for that next time we can do a song, okay? I think this song actually relates to the weather that we just had, okay? You looked out, and it was really beautiful. Probably this morning you didn't think it was quite so beautiful, I'm guessing, right? So I'd like you to join me and singing this song. <laughs> Forecast as much more raining. It's of this that I'm complaining. I get cranky from all the slop. Make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. It is dark and it's gray and it's gloomy. The climate is out to screw me. I go crazy with drip, drop, drop. Make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Every time that I look outside and I spot the sun, then I know that our weather is jackal high. When it goes out and makes a rainbow, Oh, if the rain is dropping, that my clothing will be sopping. I don't care if it's good for crops. Make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Make it stop. Okay.